Uh, Hunter, thanks. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is back in the spotlight after calls to pass it were made during the funeral of Tyree Nichols. Vice President Kamala Harris, who co-authored that bill, called for it to be passed. Joining us now to talk a little bit more about what the bill entails and how much of a difference it might make is criminal defense attorney Brian Watkins. Great to see you, Brian. Thanks for coming in. Hey, thanks for having me. So let's talk about this. I've got the Wikipedia page here. It's the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Hasn't been passed, but a lot of people saying it should be. Can you tell us what it does, how it might have helped either this, situations, this situation or other situations? That's a tough question. You know, what the act does is puts in a lot of federal laws. You understand this is a federal law, but it would apply to the states if the state police agencies receive funding from the federal government. So it would mandate them also. What does it mandate? It mandates things like, of course, federal officers would have to wear body-worn cameras, but most here in California, state police already do. It would outlaw things like the carotid restraint or the chokehold that has been caused, that has caused some death. And that would be a federal law, but if the local police agency received federal funding, then it would also have to illegalize the carotid restraint or the chokehold. It would also require um, the law of qualified immunity to be lowered, the standard on that to be lowered, so it would be easier to sue police. You know, as right now, the police are in a unique situation where they are not really liable for their civil wrongs like every other profession is, and qualified immunity insulates them from liability. You have mm -hmm. to prove that the cop pretty much did it on purpose in order to prove a cop being civilly liable for any sort of use of excessive force. And it would lower the standard to say that he did it recklessly, like he should have known. So it would make it easier for people to file civil complaints against the police. Yeah. It also expands um, commissions to investigate police misconduct. So it does things like that. It sounds like that might be the the, the, the best part of it, if you want to say that. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of body cam footage that we have. We had it for Tyree Nichols, and we certainly saw what happened to George Floyd. But tell me a little bit more about that, because on the one hand, you want a police officer to be able to go out and do their job and not be kind of worried that if they are too rough with somebody, they're going to get civilly sued. And on the other hand, maybe it would prevent them from going overboard in some of these situations where we see the video and we say, geez, do they really need to go that far? You know, th this is a really tough debate. You know, I, I don't know if you remember, if you were back, back in 1999, I did the Demetrius DeBose case, was an NFL football player who was shot and killed in Pacific Beach. Mm -hmm. And he was shot in the back seven times, and it, there was a lot of community outrage. And, of course, we, we had to file a civil lawsuit in that case. And that's when we got instrumental in making body-worn body cameras as well as beanbag guns and tasers guns as being non-lethal weapons of force that the cops must use. And now... We succeeded. All cops here in California wear body-worn cameras, and they do have non-lethal weapons such as beanbag guns and tasers. But we see here in the Tyree Nichols cases, those cops had on body-worn cameras, and yeah. it filmed them beating him up. And so it didn't prevent the excessive force being used against him. You know, yeah. so it, this we have a tough problem here with this police use of force and, and the excessive force, and you know, and the killing of, of, of suspects. Yeah. It, it, it's a tough business, no doubt. I mean, to be a police officer, I can't even imagine just the day-to-day -day what you have to go through and the kind of people that you're come encounter with. I mean, you might get killed at any moment. What else might need to be done so that people aren't getting killed unnecessarily and, on the other hand, police can kind of do their job? That is a very, very tough <laughs> balancing thing. Yeah. Well, you know, the bottom line here is people say, oh, we want more training, we want more training. There's no training. It's not like, you know, governments are saying, we have the money for this secret training technique, but we're just not going to spend it. We're not going to tell you the secret training te technique. There is no kung fu master that if you pay him, he'll teach you how to subdue a suspect if he's, you know, trying to flee you or trying to resist you, where it guarantees his safety. There, mm -hmm. there is nothing. And so what are you going to do in a situation where you have to put your hands on someone, and how can you regulate how much force is too much and how much is too little in a fluid situation such as that? It's very, very difficult to do. Sure. You know, they, this is one step in trying to make policies to help solve that problem, but is this by any means going to prevent excessive use of excessive force in the future? No. All right. Brian Watkins, good to see you, Brian. Thanks hey, for thanks for having shedding me. Shedding some light on this. All right. Hunter?